the Republican response tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. All right, let's just start the show. I've been told I'm having a bad hair day. Am I having a bad hair day? I need to, I need to really focus on this stuff. A little too poofy. And I got this good looking guy here tonight as well, which is going to just be a whole big problem. Let me tell you something. Nobody watches this show for how good I look. I can promise you that. Welcome in. Dan York State of Mind, you get what you get, baby. You get what you get. Um, we just finished taping our tomorrow night show because we do that. Sometimes we flip it for production reasons. You've got to watch that show tomorrow night because if you're interested in the medical marijuana controversy in this state, you'll really want to see what is a huge disparity of fact stipulation going on between the General Assembly and the cultivators, minimally. Um, something ain't right. Something is ripe for investigation. In the meantime, good to have you aboard, bad hair or not. It is a Thursday evening, and uh, Blake Filippi is here, uh, state representative, leader of the uh, caucus on the Republican side, offered a um, well-received, well-reviewed Republican response by the people who saw it. I never know how many people see it uh, and are watching um, state television, but I will tell you that uh, it was, it was, pretty good in terms of its uh, dynamics and its data. So we'll get into some of that this evening. In the meantime, I always ring him in anyway to an impeachment conversation. We've had a lot going on here today, headline, uh, and the formality of impeachment has, uh, has begun. The Senate now is the custodian of all this. Here's the network's latest. The articles of impeachment against President Donald Trump will be presented to the Senate at noon today. The House's hour is over. The Senate's time is at hand. Chief Justice John Roberts will soon take an oath to preside over the impeachment trial. The founders anticipated that impeachment trials would always be buffeted by the wind of politics. But they gave the power to the Senate anyway because they believed the chamber was the only place where impartial justice of the president could truly be sought. The House charges against the president stem from allegations he pressured Ukraine to investigate a political rival using military aid as leverage. Today, the Government Accountability Office issued a legal decision saying withholding those funds violated the law. This reinforces, again, the need for documents and eyewitnesses in the Senate. House Democrats released more evidence this week from Lev Parnas and associate of President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani. Parnas claimed he helped push Ukraine to announce those investigations. President Trump knew exactly what was going on. Uh, he was aware of all of my movements. Uh, he, I wouldn't do anything without the consent of Rudy Giuliani or the president. The White House insists President Trump doesn't even know Parnas. The president has said he did not know him. And I've got to say, you know, just to say Rudy told me these things doesn't mean that it has anything to do with the president. The White House argues Parnas, who has been indicted in a separate campaign finance case, is just trying to reduce his potential jail time. Philippi and I are sitting here. Uh arguing about this but no the, argument are we arguing? arguing you know what cut to him cut to him audible audible how are you i'm good oh and our state of the state response is on youtube oh it is on youtube it's on youtube anyone can how many hits there. uh we just posted it last night we have like 200 something hits okay it just started i get it, it. Just started i think it had i just four, don't know how many people watch hits on uh, wjr uh, i don't know how many how many? I think 4,000 hits on WJR. No, I listened. It was a really, really a pro effort on your part. Thank uh, you. Um, not only aesthetically, but I think you hit some points that I think are worth having a conversation over, and we shall tonight. Thank you. Um, I just don't know how many people watch Capital Television. We don't have ratings. On uh, it was on. Stuff. It was. Uh, they cut into the live stream. It was on WPRI. Yeah. It was on Channel 10. Yeah. Did, it, did it air on the? Did it air on the live? Yeah. Live? The live? Live? Yeah. Oh, yeah. you know what? We don't always do that. I was at the State House, so I missed that. So, oh, it was on the live television as well. Oh, congratulations. So a lot of people saw it. I hope. There's a good message there people need to hear. All right. You know what? Sometimes I miss the broad side of the barn. Um, <laughs> Me too. You ever thought about impeachment? Um, Let's not go long because <laughs> when, when you and I get going, we get going. Uh, I think everything still comes down to Trump's state of mind, bringing all the witnesses. Just because the House didn't bring in enough witnesses, I don't think we should have the Senate also having a flawed process. Bring them in. Let's have a conversation. 
Fantastic. I think that's and I think that I think that's all anybody's looking for. And, and my other thoughts on it is this, I, by the I, way, I from the Republican parties, minority leader in Rhode Island. Uh, just note, bring think, them in. I think both parties love it. It riles up their base. and They don't have to talk about some of the real issues we face in Washington, D.C. How about like, that? Like a 75,000 page tax code that enables big corporations to not pay any taxes. In the meantime, we, we got to be talking about that before we talk about anything else. Got gotcha. you. So focused, so disciplined. Convention Center headline here. This is interesting. Don't have a lot of time for this, but I've seen Tim White's excellent piece on this. The state police are admitting to looking into an allegation here that an ally of the speaker who had an employment issue at the convention center um, might have been catalytic to the Joint Committee on Legislative Services, which is the arm, which is the, you know, the business operations center for the General Assembly, calling on an audit of same organization, um, something that hadn't been done in 10 years. You have a concern about this? So I think we need to be careful. We're not seeing causation, uh, correlation as causation. The Republicans have been calling for an audit of the convention center since I think 2015. Hmm. Um, the w whether what was the cause for the auditor general going in? I don't know. The JCLS didn't vote for this. I believe in the aud auditor general's letter he said that the JCLS directed him to do this audit. Uh, there was no vote. I didn't vote. I'm on JCLS. I wasn't aware of it. I didn't vote up or down. Uh, when we empowered the Auditor General in the 2020 budget this past June um, to have more investigatory powers, the Republicans put in a, an, am an amendment re requiring that a majority of JCLS would have to vote for any of these audits. Uh, that, that was voted down by our Democratic colleagues. And I don't know why this audit Why they always have a majority anyway. Yeah, I know. I know. There's I mean, five members of the JCLS, so you understand that. It's the leadership. It's the speaker, uh, his uh, majority leader. It is the Senate president. Um, the Senate? It's the, 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 the two leaders, the Senate president and the speaker. Three House members, two Senate me members. On the House side, speaker, majority leader, minority leader. On the Senate side, Senate president and minority leader. So there's three right. Democrats, two Republicans. And the Senate's always kind of been upset at the House that they don't have equal representation on the JCLS. Maybe. In terms, of, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, the power is is aggregated in the House, right? Um, but it's also a political issue. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Dennis Algier and myself, we're just two of three, right. so we can't call meetings. Got we can't. You know. My point is, is that there's usually three Democrats anyway, so I don't yeah. know why they would complain about that. All right, so this is something that is of concern to you, yes? I, I need to learn more facts. No, I have to talk. Well, your colleagues. Republican chairperson is already, you know, putting out press releases about what kind of a big problem this whole thing is. So she, she's she's the political arm of the Republican Party. I'm an elected official. I have a responsibility to not be political when we deal with these issues. I saw this uh, Tim White and Ted Nisi story when I was driving up here today, mm -hmm. and those are the facts that I know. Hmm. Um, but I'm always concerned when there's an investigation. I think we need to make sure that everything's always on the up and up. Hmm. Uh, could it be causation? Maybe. Could it also just be correlation? Maybe. Or coincidence. A coincidence. Is that what correlation means? Yeah, correlation. Similar to coincidence. Headline, is Mattiello using the JCLS to retaliate? Question mark. Question mark. So the Republican Party political operation is okay to raise these kinds of suspicious questions, their word, while you play the role of steady hand. I think that's what's, what is, expe uh, is expected of elected representatives is to not play politics all the time. It is the job of the party to, play to politics. be politics, to do political issues. And a lot of times political issues drive good policy. Okay. So pressure, political pressure may create better policy, but our job as elected officials is to be the steady hand, as you said. Old negotiating tactics can be described as white hat, black hat. So the political party plays black hat and you play white hat in terms of interest of the, in getting to the truth. I don't know that there's co um, cooperation. Like We're not dealing with each other right now on this. I just learned of this story. And there's more facts I want to get to the bottom of. But right. I, th I, I think the chairperson knows of the political party what my role is and she respects it. And my role is one of being deliberative and getting the facts. Responsible. Where am I? When we come back, we'll get to the big picture. The whole picture, nothing but the picture. So help us God, stay with us.
to the states. Romano pushes for more housing, better education. Uh, devils in the details. And then, of course, there's also a conceptual issue here. Here's a, here was the summary of the speech, and then we'll talk to the GOP leader about it. Our economy is as strong today as it's been in a generation. Strong, but not enough. That's how Governor Gina Raimondo described the state of the state of Rhode Island in her address Tuesday night. A major focus of that speech, education, especially in light of the recent state takeover of Providence Public Schools. I also want every Rhode Islander to know that our work in education is absolutely not limited to the city of Providence. We are every bit as focused on improving outcomes for every child in every school district across our state. In order to do that, the governor is again proposing $30 million to support students and teachers statewide, a more than 50% increase in the number of public pre-K seats. And in terms of higher education, she has proposed making the Promise Scholarship, which offers free tuition at CCRI, permanent. You know, I love the ideas. Uh, all of the initiatives were good ones. But you have to look at where the funding is going to come from and, and evaluate it on that basis. One of the governor's proposals that both House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello and Senate President Dominic Ruggiero supported was one to make Rhode Island the first state in the country to be 100% powered by renewable energy by the end of the decade. Both the Senate and the House has been on the forefront of alternative energy uh, for the past 10 years. We're looking to expand that. I think the governor has a great initiative that, that, that she's looking to do. The House Speaker and Senate President weren't sold on the governor's push for Rhode Island to adopt a line item veto, which would give her the power to veto individual line items in the budget without rejecting the entire document. We have an excellent budget process. We've been recognized nationally for that. So I always uh, express caution at messing with something that works very well. Uh, I was in the middle of that scrum. I think you can see my hand. Not that that matters. I'm just telling you. And I, I had a lengthy conversation with the Speaker and the Senate President about the line item veto. And I find their arguments to be in part specious. Uh, this is ridiculous. 66% of Rhode Islanders reportedly want to see the governor have a hand in a line item. Uh, 44 states in the country have it. And he suggests that all the scholars he could ever find say it's terrible. Well, no, only the scholars that he brought together in some hack forum that he put together two years ago to kind of, uh, you know, suffice for his. His argument. I can't wait to get the speaker here soon uh, because you know I'm going to have a Donny Brook. It's just, it's just, it's going to be a throwdown on, on a lot of this stuff. Um, here's the thing. Do you agree with me that the governor is classic toe in the water here? Calls for it and then backs away. It's kind of her mo. If she sat on him with 66 percent momentum in the state, you'd have a real ally there. I mean, it's something Republicans have been calling for for a very long time before the governor called for it. It's an initiative that I think we need to get a, our hands around our $10 billion budget. Do I think she could do more to drive the conversation? Yes. Yes, I think she could be working with members of the General Assembly. Many times things bubble up from the bottom. And uh, if enough members are clamoring for it, it's hard to not respond. Well, it's interesting being in the building uh, and, and watching. The response uh, to the line on veto message that she brought, uh, standing ovation from her staff, a couple of state officers, the Republicans, and a straggling Democrat or two. Everyone else sat on their hands because you know, they know this. But this is this is the thing the speaker will die on. It's a hill he will die on. Um, Remember, I think last year, the year before, every senator. And perhaps he will die on it politically. Every senator signed on to the line item veto bill, from the Senate president down to the most lowly new freshman. Right. Was a co-sponsor on the Senate line item. Well, it bill. seems that the Senate president is more open to running another another vote on this thing. So it would be interesting to see if the Senate voted yes and toss it to the House. That would, but it would put the Speaker at least on his heels a little bit. It seems to me it's a political football. I think they passed it, but they wouldn't send it over. I think they they had all the sponsors on it and they just held on to the bill. Well, they didn't they, send it well, to well, us. With more pressure this year, yeah, who I think knows? gamesmanship was played. Twenty twenty is probably the last opportunity for the governor to, to weigh in strong. You know, Ken Block was talking yeah. about it the other day. Watchdog, two-time gubernatorial candidate, and he'll be one of the leading fighters for this whole thing. Um, but I think you're on the right side of that one, uh, no doubt. The uh, some of the other uh, issues that the governor raised uh, were pretty dynamic. Uh, you think that she may be overestimating her executive power. 
on the electricity. Yes. Yeah, definitely. If if the governor on the, on the windmills and the whole the turbines. Yeah, this that. it's a legislative it's a legislative issue, saying how much the people have to buy. If you know she wants to move government to purchasing 100 percent renewable energy, I think she has that executive authority. But I think it has to be a legislative act saying that the people of Rhode Island have to have 100 percent of their electric makeup be mm. renewable. Education, you've got this new idea. Uh, you want to develop these centers. What are they? So it's, that's actually the second idea. The first idea, and I think the primary idea, is to give parents of children in failing school districts the ability to get their, their kids out of that school district and send them elsewhere. To another public district. To another public school. I couldn't agree with you more. Intra-Rhode Island public school choice would be wonderful. If you're in a failing school district. We're not even going so far as to say everyone. Just if you're in a failing school district. Defined as? Defi so we want to take the, the existing standardized test score and we think somewhere around under 20%. You know, we're, we're dealing with experts. We want to get everyone on board to this concept and find a, a number that denotes you the school district. You can do it if you find, and only if you find, an, an accessible transportation plan. Yes. You can't say some kid from inner city Central Falls can go to Barrington without saying there's a way to get there from here. And, and that's where our new tax on universities comes in. We have a new tax that we're proposing on the endowments, substantial endowments of universities and colleges that don't pay property taxes right now. Hmm. So, uh, me from Block Island, the City of I, Providence wants a piece of that action. By the way, they've been asking for that for a long time. Not only is this a, C a City of Providence issue, we give three hundred and twenty-four million dollars a year in state aid to Providence and its school system. Me from Block Island, I pay more for the Providence school system than Brown University does. Hmm. Brown University sits on $1 billion of real estate on the east side of Providence and has an over $4 billion investment portfolio. These are their future students that are not getting educated. They so, like to get away from the tax thing and just provide a gift. Yeah, a pilot, about $10 million. I mean, their tax rate would be over $30 million on the east side, just with their east side property. You think you could eventually ever dedicate that kind of a tax? to a revenue stream that provides transportation. Here's the problem. Every time anybody, either side of the aisle, decides, well, we want to do this, and so we'll tax that to get it, money goes in the general fund and then goes Yeah, I get it. I, I, I think if any of these taxes have to happen, it's in a restricted receipt account that mitigates the cost of our failing school, school choice program, and also the second school program that you had mentioned, which are language academies, state-run language academies, where their sole focus is to teach children English, and once they learn English, the kids matriculate back to their sending school district. We have an English as second language crisis in this state. Many times when we talk about why we have failing school districts, hmm. our educators say, we have so many English as second language students, that's our problem. You know, it's, it, it, but it goes back, there's, the debates on this have been going back and forth. It's kind of like term limits and all sorts of other things where people bop back and forth depending on who's made the best argument that day. Have you talked to the Ed Commissioner about this concept? Uh, so members of our, in our office who are much more versed in a choice than me have spoken to our office. No, I'm talking about the language issue. The language issue. The, the learning well, so, so this is interesting. Providence has a newcomer school system. They have, they have a ded dedicated school for newcomers. Twenty-eight states have them to a su success in everywhere from Unless Queens. Unless I'm mistaken, I'm not sure that they're exclusively language only. Oh, they're, no, they're dedicated to newcomers. And their primary focus is to teach kids how to speak English. In Providence, their, the intent is to have them stay anywhere from six months to two years. And once they're proficient in English, they go into the existing school system. Mm. This, they, they're in San Francisco. This isn't some conservative idea. They're being put to great use oh, okay. well, all over this country. It seems to me that you'd want to hook up the Ed Commission with those ideas because that's, you know, she still has early equity. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the speech we gave is our bro broad ideas, and now we're putting our nose to the grindstone and, like, hammering out the details. And, of course, bringing Commissioner Infante Green in is one of, our, one of our goals. All right. We'll take off a couple of other items when we come back. Stay with us. It is no coincidence that Boston is booming while our tallest building stands empty. This is the result of our hostile business climate. Many times, it does not make sense to invest in Rhode Island unless you can obtain handouts of taxpayer-funded corporate welfare. Not only is it morally wrong to hand out our money to businesses, it further scares away other investment because they do not want to compete against those getting public monies. We must enact intelligent tax policies and regulatory reform that everyone can take advantage of. 
Outstanding. Here's Thank the you. thing. Uh, Unsolicited advice, like I've never given that to you no. before. <laughs> can we start, stop, can we just, it wasn't there, but can, can we stop talking about cutting government and, and shaving spending and talk about the fertile ground that you're talking about in terms of a tax program that would grow the economy. Because you keep pointing to Boston as having a billion dollar surplus, but if you yeah. look at the gross number, their budgets have increased every year. We're never going to shorten the budget. It's $9.97 billion now. It's going to be $10.04 billion when this thing comes out in a minute. Right? You can control the growth. You can control growth. You can control Discipline's the growth. Discipline's important. But that's, see, that's different. I think people start to go, ah, well, you're never going to cut the budget, and they, and they tune out. I don't want your good ideas to get tuned out. Anyway, you have the floor. What do you? What's the question? Well, you can develop. <laughs> you know, what what is the fertile ground? What I mean, what is that thing that you're trying to do for a new tax policy to grow the state? So, no, you don't like to pick winners yeah, and losers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, we, gotcha. we talked about that. So, I, I, I think about it's, two minutes. I think it's clear when you look at CNBC rankings, and we're always at the bottom of the list of the the best places to invest your money. We have one of the most hostile business climates. One place we look at year after year is the TPP, the Tangible Personal Property Tax. So if you're a company that wants to move it's here. terrible. Terrible. You're a company that wants to move here, invest in new high-tech equipment, you're actually taxed on the value of that equipment. We're making companies not invest up. We're making them keep this old equipment. They're not buying new stuff. And if you're someone who wants to come here and build a factory. So if you eliminated that, to be what on the budget and what, what would the recovery need be? Oh, I, I mean, Anytime you cut a tax, I wonder where are we going to find the revenue? Yeah, yeah, it's it's mostly local. Rather it's than mo it's, it mo it's mostly coming. local taxes. Hmm. It's mostly local taxes. Right. Yeah, it, the local I, don't, I don't have it in my head per town. Local communities want to know, you know, okay, you're going to take that away from me. What are we going to do? They're like on drugs. Yeah, yeah. So they I start mean, to shake. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> they do. We, we we did an in depth analysis. I mean, every town there was a number. I, I just don't have it have it in front of me. But it's one of those things that businesses look at and say, why do I want to invest in new equipment? Yeah, but it seems to me that every time you say let's stop doing this when, uh, with this uh, revenue attached to it, you got to know how much it is and how you're going to replace it or why you don't have to replace it. We have those numbers. We have those, we have those numbers. I just didn't bring them. I didn't know you. Were, oh. I didn't know what you were going to ask me, Dan. You asked me about everything from impeachment to investigations at the convention center. Well, here's the situation. You're becoming big time. <laughs> no, you you got to be able to walk around with this stuff in your head. No, Some other things are, uh, is like keeping all our money from our seniors here. You know, we were just rated as yeah. one of the worst, the worst states in the country to retire in. Yes. And it's our, our taxes and our, um, our cost of living. I have 20 seconds. Taxes on a compelling legislative income. session coming up or routine, quick. Uh, to be determined. Bye. The ether, what happens out there? I mean, there's times that I thought it was going to be quiet and it turned crazy and vice versa. I, I just don't know. I don't think you know until the budget comes out what's, what it's going to be like. All right. Keep the dialogue moving. Anytime. Get the numbers, will you? Yeah, I'll bring it to you. Final word when we come back. Listen, on a legislative basis, the Republican Party is in pretty good hands right now. And Spike Filippi's got a handle, I think, on a lot of good stuff. The danger is you get abstract and you start talking about things in general, and it all ends up, as he would use uh, the term, in the ether, right? Uh, you got to pick a couple winners, and you got to slam down hard. What they choose is their discretion, but that's how you get traction. We'll see you tomorrow night on this medical marijuana thing. It's important. Good night.